Gustavo, and thanks for the invitation. This is the first time I'm uh, speaking actually at a um, Krakow Scala user group meeting. Very happy to be here. My name is Jan, Jan Pustelnik. Um, this is my um, Twitter handle, and I would like to, to speak about real serverless, so something that doesn't actually use any servers. And it has to do with the company I work in, so I'm currently working in a small startup in Munich, in Germany, that's doing software for factories. It's called Actix, and we do things like that. That's a, that's a software to basically track what's happening on the shop floor in, in the factory. So this is one of, the, uh, one of our products. And if you, if you look at the, at the shop floor in a factory, how, how the shop floor looks like, it's something like that. That's a very old picture of the factory shop floor, but it still applies today. So for instance, if you'd, if you'd like to see how, how a shop floor looks today, this is quite recent picture of a shop floor at one of our customers. Um, who can see danger radiation sign? Somewhere there. There is a danger radiation sign. Um, also, um, there, is a, there is also one important thing there, namely, that actually, uh, if, you, if you look at, at, at this environment, it's pretty hostile to computers, and it's also pretty hostile to networking. So in order to get it actually working in that environment, we needed to solve a couple of puzzles. And one of the puzzles is how to make everything work without actually having a network. I mean, that is going to be very difficult, but let's say, with having a flaky network. So a network that comes and goes. Uh, so if you see the product, the product is uh, currently installed at a tablet. It can be installed on a PC, on a tablet, anywhere. But if it's installed on a tablet, someone is moving with this tablet to go to different places in the factory, and then they might have some problems with the network connectivity. OK, so the solution is to get rid of servers. So do work only with clients, so to speak. So it's like, okay, n nothing, nothing of that sort. We just want to do uh, to do away with uh, clients. That's one of the um, one of the challenges. And I would like to show you two parts of the solution of this challenge that both somehow relate to Scala. One of them is just some Scala code, and the other is uh, a very nice thing that's hidden in, the, you know, stashed away somewhere um, in unused closet of the ACA library, namely it's the CRDT thingy, or distributed data. The distributed data tells you how to distribute data uh, to, like, multiple independent devices. Um, by the way, I could run the whole example using only ACA distributed data. So I could cobble it up only using ACA distributed data. Um, I couldn't actually use the, the other technology which I would like to talk about. So basically my problem is how to distribute the, the data to devices and how to run it only with those devices with sometimes with the connectivity on and off. So my solution of choice is to use a peer-to-peer -peer technology. And actually, ACA distributed data is also a peer-to-peer -peer technology. But also, peer-to-peer -peer technology is the Internet Protocol itself. So Internet Protocol, IP, was designed to actually run in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. We don't speak about clients, servers, masters, slaves, and so on, using IP. It's just IP addresses and routes that connect things, and roots can change, actually. So, so you get the idea of some packet-oriented communication between the nodes, but none of the hierarchy. OK, so this is a burning factory, and a factory of fire is not a good thing, but actually we just deal with a flaky Wi-Fi. And let's say we, we got people who are picking orders. So one of the applications is warehouse management thing. And warehouse management thing needs to solve 
the problem of a guy w walking around shop floor and picking items. So let's say he's got this item. It's article blue, ID is something, quantity is something, and then complete is false, which means that this item is not picked because he wants to pick it and supply to the people who are doing work on the shop floor. So what he wants to do is he wants to turn the line in this JSON to true. In order to do that, he will go to a place hidden somewhere, maybe behind the corner where the Wi-Fi doesn't reach. He would take the item, tick true. He will see on his device that it turned to true, but actually the system won't see him. This is, the system will not notice that he actually ticked this uh, item. But when he will go back to the place where he has got connectivity, then instantly the system will communicate and see that this item has been picked. That's basically the business idea behind it. So you, so you get business uh, level people who are saying this should work like that. That's, that's product people. And we, the IT people, would need to figure out how to make it, make it work. Following everyone with a cable is not a solution. Making Wi-Fi working is also out of scope because we don't own the shop floor in terms of the equipment. So we cannot completely revamp the shop floor. Um, okay, the other problem is we have lots of orders uh, and lots of materials for a single order. So in order to complete an order, let's say ABC123, you would need to pick up one material, the other material, and the other material. And, well, theoretically, people could be picking them uh, concurrently. Let's say this, this example just shows how to pick the orders uh, one after another. Okay, so basically part of the solution is storing JSON in a tree, which MongoDB is one of the answers, but actually installing MongoDB on every tablet, you might imagine, it's not the best solution, despite Mongo being web scale and uh, all that. Because the warehouse actually looks like, looks like this. Okay, so, so the solution actually turns up uh, to be something um, kind of a distributed data structure. And I would like to show you one solution to, to the problem of distributing data structures, which is, which is kind of nice. It doesn't have large uh, footprint of running and um, serves the pur purpose well. And this is interplanetary file system, which is basically a way of storing your data in a distributed manner uh, with a peer-to-peer, -peer, in a peer-to-peer, -peer, completely peer-to-peer -peer fashion. So I will show you a couple of examples. If you want to actually run it, just install the IPFS um, binary. Um, I've installed on a remote computer, I've just installed the IPFS client. I'm not running IPFS uh, daemon, I'm just running IPFS client, but for, for this, in order to work, I would also need to run IPFS daemon. I don't know if it's going to work. No. Uh, okay, because someone is listening on, on a port. Anyway, but this is something, uh, this is something uh, I, would be, I would be actually running. I don't need it in order to show those examples because I will be showing them only on a particular client. But actually, if I, if I wanted uh, this to, to work in a distributed fashion, each of my devices would need to be running an IPFS uh, daemon. That's uh, exactly the same as you would have to, as e if you want to uh, solve the problem with ACA distributed data, you would need to run a cluster, ACA cluster, and the nodes would need to communicate somehow inside of the ACA cluster. So either you build an ACA cluster, I will speak about building ACA cluster later, or you actually do, do it like this. So IPFS basically contains, um, uh, IPFS basically contains tools to communicate, for the processes to communicate with each other, and tools for discovery. You can think it, uh, about a like early days Skype, where it's actually, uh, 
peer-to-peer -peer communication. So there are some uh, components for piercing firewalls, uh, going over uh, from TCP to UDP to some other ways of pushing packets, uh, trying to use uh, some sort of uh, external help, uh, doing NAT traversals and so on. And, uh, and there is some layer that works basically as a distributed hash table mm -hmm. and uh, so effectively as a bit torrent. So you can, you can think about uh, IPFS as a bit, bit torrent client, basically. Um, what else? There are two kinds of swarms. One of them is a public swarm. So if you publish something here in the public swarm, you publish it to the whole world and the whole world will see it and you cannot actually, uh, some things that, that have been seen cannot be unseen, so if you publish something there, uh, it's not good, maybe. But you can have also private swarm that's crypto cryptographically um, sort of uh, validated, so everything is encrypted and if you don't have a key, you cannot actually do anything. So the private swarm is only for, for the people who have this particular encryption key, okay. So how to use IPFS? IPFS is very, very simple to use. So what I'm going to do, I have a file here. It's called foo, right? And it contains the word foo. And I'm going to put it into IPFS. So I say IPFS add foo. And what I'm getting back is, can you see, is it big enough? I'm getting back a hash of it. So if I say IPFS uh, cat, and I put the hash here, uh, I'm getting back a foo. So let me edit, sorry, dim, um, bar. Oh, actually, Vim user, I just wanted to, okay. IPFS add foo txt. Did you notice the hash is not exactly the same? The hash is different. So actually, it turns out that this is IPFS cat and, and this hash. It, it is actually content addressable storage. So if I, if I put this here, I'll get a foo again, because it just hashes my content. So the hash is pretty, pretty good. I mean, we shouldn't be expecting any collisions uh, any real soon. So when you do that, you, you can actually be pretty sure that you got a unique content out of it. Uh, and of course, IPFS never forgets. Uh, that's a combina combination of like three hashes. I don't remember exactly. It's SHA-256 and then some other hashes. Uh, it might be changing from version to version though. That's one of the caveats uh, connected to IPFS. So um, the problem of re readability old data, um, it's not solved and IPFS is evolving quite quickly. So that might be uh, one of the issues. Okay, so this is, uh, this is nice, but um, actually I, I, I want to be storing not that, but I want to be storing JSON. Uh, so this is my JSON and let's say IPFS uh, add whenever JSON. It's one of the things I can do and I can get uh, IPFS cat whenever JSON. Uh, no, I just need to cut this hash, but, but I told you that I want to actually turn IPFS into a MongoDB. So I want to turn it into a storage of JSONs. So in order to, to do that, I can use something else that's called DAG. So I can put a JSON into a DAG. That's a different kind of hash. That's a different, let's say different hashing scheme, a bit different. Uh, that's done on purpose, so you don't mix those two kinds of hashes. And let's say IPFS DAG get, and let's put, did you, did you see, IPFS actually has a very simple API. Those guys don't need to do uh, too much thinking. Uh, the API is just like four operations, more or less. 
pull file, get file, duck pull, duck get. This is a bit of simplica simplification. Did you notice, by the way, that this JSON is not exactly the same as this JSON? Well, if you use DAG operations, IPFS would actually canonicalize JSON, do some standardization to the JSON before it does. So it's good for, for JSON, actually JSON-oriented databases, because if two JSONs are functionally the same, they should roughly return the same after putting and getting and so on. Um, okay, so duck put, duck get, but we are not finished yet because the problem is how to do the structure thingy. Um, and the structure thingy we are doing with something that's called IPLD, and the IPLD works like that. Uh, I've put some data, so I've put that stuff into um, into my. Will it work? Yes, it works. So I put some state uh, stuff IPFS dag get. I got it back, and you see it's canonicalized. But I would like to actually uh, do something uh, useful. We'll get back to the Scala code soon. Um, so actually, I would like to be doing something like that. I want to do IPFS dag get some root hash. That's going to be my root hash. The microphone. Can I put? Um, I, I'm not sure if it's plugged in at all. Um, so some root hash, slash orders, slash ABC, and, and so on. So like basically Mongo equivalent. And I would like to, to be getting something like that. And I'm not exactly at, at the place. But actually, I can use this IPLD standard, which is basically um, implemented by the IPFS DUG API. Basically, what it does, it... It uses this sort of thingy to indicate traversal. So I have this hash here, which is the hash of um, the, um, the JSON hash of this JSON, or duck hash of this JSON. And I can create a structure like that. So I can say this, okay, and I, and let me paste it here. Hopefully it will work. IPFS dag get. That's very useless. If you, if you look at it, it might seem very useless exercise. Completely pointless. But when I do this, um, and do slash gx123, and do slash gx123, this will actually get me the glue. I could try doing something like that. Glue, okay, by the way. I didn't know that it works like that. I just tried it. Complete? Yeah, false, not complete yet. Okay. You cannot see it. Yeah? Okay, so again, slash ID. And it's going to be this ID. So pretty nifty. Um, works very well as a Mongo DB thingy. Um, just, just you need some, some API, actually, some proper API over that to use it in your Scala program. Because like that, it's not very usable. Because let me, let me tell you what's my problem. My problem is something like that. I'm, I'm the picker, I'm the older picker, and I would like to turn the complete to true. So I do something like that. Echo, how do I even do that? Echo this, IPFS dag put. And it's safe and sound in my IPFS. There you see, but the problem is that now, it's unreachable. That's completely different hash. So how to, how to get it? Now, after I change this value to true, did I? Ah, 
Because why are you, 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 why are you not shouting? True. That's a different hash. Yeah, you see, content as addressable storage. I turned it to true, but I, I don't know how to reach it. I would like to do the same nifty trick. So what I, what I need to do is I need to say something like that. I need to, I need to put this. I need to do some serious stuff. Echo. I need to put this, but of course not this, because here we should have we should be having the other hash. Uh, and as you obviously noticed, it's kind of okay. And IPFS Doug put right. So I changed the hash. Uh, maybe I can change the size of this. Is it better? Is it way better? Am I selling you this? Right. So I did something like that, and then IPFS dag get. This is slash gx gx one two three. Okay, complete true. So slash complete will yield us true. So you probably noticed that, um, sorry, we need to cut it out. So you probably noticed that uh, basically uh, what we have here uh, is uh, best done with a computer. So if you have a uh, if you have a computer, it it seems that it's like uh, the the best way of of actually uh, solving this problem. And if I have a computer, I can have Scala, and I can probably solve it uh, with Scala. Uh, the the other problem is the propagation of root hashes. So for every update that happens to the client, you need to propagate the the root hash of uh, of the change because every change needs to trickle up to the root hash it will change the root hash and from the root hash you'll get the whole structure by the way this is some sort of um, persistent uh, persistent log for free so if you if you notice uh, we are we are just getting this um, this stuff absolutely for free okay so now it comes to the computer thingy. So IPFS DAG put. How do I, that's, yeah, that's my, that's my, there is a Scala client. It hasn't been touched like for the last three years. It's probably out of sync because like three years ago the IPFS project probably didn't even exist. It just had a Scala client, nothing else. Uh, so this is my nice Scala client. This is the, uh, the DAG put. Um, and this is the DAG get. It, it, it kind of works. It's production ready thingy. Um, okay, and now how to implement the um, the whole the whole stuff. So uh, how to how to implement it? This is kind of uh, rubbish. Right, with three monads. That's that's one of the one of the uh, sol solutions. Why? Let me tell you why. I, I'm, not a, I, I'm not a very big monad lover. I'm moderately big on monads. Okay? So like maybe not, not the way like some, some people are on monads uh, and on cats and uh, free monads and so on. There's a lot of interesting introductions. But what actually, what actually monads are good at is monads can turn, uh, can, can implement the interpreter pattern so you can have a program and you can write that program and then this three monad thingy is actually just an interpreter for, for, the, pro uh, for, for the program. So actually, and actually three monad is, is, is not about monad, it's not about three, it's just about interpreting things. The name is a bit misleading, but I kind of like it. So my, in order to actually use the free monad, that's a sad thing, you need to do a lot of lifting. So you, you might know one of the speakers who's, who does, who's very much into monads, and he's doing also lots of lifting. 
and um, that's that's one of the the issues. But we can do the lifting also on the computer. So this is just an interface API for put and get. And this is, by the way, an example I just copied from from Cats. Uh, so you can just download the, uh, uh, the the Cats help page and and you can just actually actually copy it. So the the interpreter for for this looks like looks like that, or would look like that. So this is the real interpreter, which would actually turn a real, uh, a real program, um, sorry, a program written in a free monad into a real IPFS execution. So basically, you, you just need to take one of those operations here, so either put or get, and you need to put it into the context of a monad, so let's say lift it into this free monad, and then you just do a case evaluation of whether it's a put or get, extract the value or a path, and then plug the code that I've just shown you, which is just some bullet bulletproof production code. Uh, right, this is just a technicality. That's actually um, simplification for our programs that's uh, actually doing the lifting for you, so the lifting adapter, and it just uh, lifts this put value to IPFS store. I've had some discussion with purists who said that actually, uh, that actually option is not a good type to return because, you know, none if an error and some if you got something. Well, that's a nice exercise to clean up technical debt. Move later to either. <coughs> and if you just add fix me to it, then it's going to be fine. And then hopefully sometime later you might even actually fix it. Um, okay, so this is how our program could look like for this monad. So I have an IPFS store program that just stores thingy. And the cool thing that this slide has a lie on it. And Conrad actually asked the question which would reveal immediately the lie here. The problem is that this program will never work on a real interpreter because this is just a SHA-256. Uh, so if I hard-coded a, um, uh, hard -coded here, an implementation of uh, this magical code, that you get returned here, so so basically, uh, so basically this wouldn't work. So this program would convert this to JSON. So this map AAA to AAA would be converted to JSON, and would be would be uh, put, and then the resulting resulting um, hash could be then used to get it. I'm actually using a hard-coded hash here. So I'm just hard-coding this and trying to get it. Um, this is a test interpreter which works with the fake implementation of uh, this. I'm not showing it here. Maybe later if we have time, but probably not. But you can see uh, the slides, both the slides and and uh, my presentation at the um, Scalar YouTube channel. So let's let's more speak about how to how to actually work with that. So this is a more involved implementation. I'm putting uh, a map AAA to AAA, and then I'm saying BBB would point in IPLD fashion to slash. And then I'm putting here a hash of this whole thing. So something like that. That's actually what uh, the implementation would be, would be returning. And then I can say get me, um, get me this back. So back, basically the whole object, the whole aggregate is something like that. Okay, so how to actually turn it into a working program on a computer. So this more or less resembles what I've been just doing here in the console. I'm putting 
a map of AAA to AAA. So eco AAA to AAA. IPFS DAG put. And then I'm getting it. IPFS DAG get. And in order to get it, I need to plug I I need to plug this thing over here. No, I didn't copy it. I've copied it now. So I'm getting AA8 and then the AA8. And this is my program. And now let's say to this SHA, I'm, I'm going to put this uh, value into this structure. So the second step here would be doing, would be doing this. It would get this hash, which I have here, and would say echo BBB. And that would be um, slash point to, uh, how do I put those hashes like that? And point to this hash. So this is the AAA hash. And like that, like put. Now I would get hash back. And then I could use this hash saying, this hash slash BBB and say IPFS dag get uh, sorry slash uh, BBB and it's going to be the same AAA again. So this program actually did exactly that what I did on the console. And the other thing good with the free monad is I can uh, have either a fake implementation or a real implementation. Actually, the problem is with fake implementation, I, I probably need to write the copy of, of the very thing. So as your, as your IPFS usage uh, evolves, then you're probably going to have more complex e implementations of your fakes. But it's nice because you can actually test, not integrate test, but you need to test your programs, even complex ones. And then you can, uh, let's say, attach a flaky network to it. So run a flaky IPFS implementation just by means of writing code. So not in order not to prolong it, that's basically what I want to do. I want to have a hash. At the beginning, it might be completely fake. I want to have a path, and I want to store a JSON here. So this is something like that. And basically, in order to do that, I can actually use the language I've just described with those two operations. So what I need to do is I need to split the path and remove duplicates. Then I'm going to be building, uh, I'm going to be building um, the structure back from the change. So I will basically, what I, what I would do, the split path um, is uh, splitting the path into elements. Then I'm going to be building them uh, into full paths starting, uh, so like slash A, slash A, A, B, A, B, C, and A, B, C, D. And I will be got, going up in, in the path. So, so I need to start basically uh, with the most elementary operation. So I'm going to put an element. I'm going to put an element into um, into here. So this is my element, and this is just a slash link. A slash link uh, like the one here in the um, in this uh, in the structure. So I'm taking something that I want to put here. It might be my JSON, and uh, it might be just a hash of of this JSON. And I'm putting it as an as an element. I'm converting it to to JSON, and I'm going to be putting it here. And this is going to be concatenated with the external element of, 
of the path. So this single ring, so to speak, is going to be recursively uh, is going to be recursively combined. Um, so for every element of the uh, of the sub paths, uh, so those those paths. So starting from here, I will be adding an element. So I will start from this full path, so A, B, C, D, and I will store at that element, I will store the, um, the hash of uh, my object. Then I would take this hash and store it at root A, B, C. And then I will just uh, so on and so on, recurse, until I get to the root, and then instead of the root from which I started, which could be completely fake, it doesn't matter, it might be something, might be nothing, I will return a new root, which is actually um, uh, the handle to the whole data structure. By the way, if you have previous root, a new root, and if you have an even source stream of roots, you can actually see your full history. So this is something like a um, you're getting an even, lo even log for free, actually. Okay, so now how to, yes, how to propagate the stream of hashes to your devices. So one of the tools, by the way, you could, you could run the whole example with the ACA distributed data. Uh, one, of the, one of the things you can use it, you can t use to do it, is ACA distributed data. And you can nicely use the LWW map to do that. So this is a map, distributed map. So distributed among all your clients that's going from order ID to the current hash. And if you have an ACA cluster, so if you're all uh, clients form the, uh, the ACA cluster, you also need them to form an IPFS cluster, then basically it works like that. Let's say on one of the nodes, you wrote here a change. So you went from bar to buzz, you wrote a change. And then this is going to be propagated by uh, the mechanism of um, well, basically, in, uh, in CRDTs, we have two basic mechanisms. One is the direct update, the other is uh, the cluster gossip. So let's say for simplification, it will be uh, for sure disseminated using the cluster gossip mechanism. So it, it will reach all the elements of cluster, changing the value. So, and if you add a third node to the cluster that doesn't know anything about what just happened, it will get the full update. So this is, this is basically how the distributed data, data works. So now we have a channel for disseminating all of your updates also in a fully peer-to-peer -peer fashion. There are some caveats here. So for instance, what happens if I have an old update? I'm seeing a state in the past. But what is really important about the CRDTs and the ACA distributed data is that actually if you say about eventual consistency, the definition of eventual consistency doesn't mean anything. It means that in some future that might be just one second before the heat death of the universe, you'll get the correct state. In between, you could be actually getting totally anything. You could be getting total rubbish. Here, what you're getting is not eventual consistency, is monotonic consistency. So your states, the states of the cluster, the states of the elements evolve in an ordered fashion. So if you have two updates to the source object, so let's say I would turn first uh, bar to bus and then full to bar, I would get them in roughly the same order, I will get them, no sorry, I will get them in the same order uh, at the target. I said roughly the same order because this is last right wins map and actually it uses, uh, it uses uh, wall clock time. So the problem is that if you write two objects in the same time, the one with the latest time 
wins. But you, if you're writing just one object on one computer, this is going to be perfectly consistent because two updates are going to be in the same order and once they are applied in this particular order and one node on the source node, they will be applied on all nodes in the same order. You can also use a different structure, which is, for instance, the um, uh, all observed, uh, sorry, it's like OR observed, re observed removed map, or actually re observed removed multi map, which is causal, and it uses the ca causal relationship. So if you add on one node and you would like to delete another node, you first need to see the addition in order to delete something. So mm. you can build quite um, quite interesting uh, way of tracking how things have happened or how ha they have evolved uh, in in the order they were happening. Uh, you can you can actually you can actually uh, use also some tools in IPFS for dissemination of that, but you don't have that kind of fine grained control over the um, causality unless you implement it yourselves in terms of uh, Lampot vec vector clocks, let's say. But you get it from Arca distributed data for free. And in that way, you run a completely distributed system. Now, if you're completely sold on it and you say, I want it, before you say you want it, that the problem is that it's not for free. It's not completely free. So if you would like to use a system like that, you need to think about your actual business model because this is, this is now how the system works is not non-functional requirement. It's actually functional requirement. So if you want to, if you say two people can pick orders in the same time, you might need to change the implementation significantly in terms of the uh, elements you're using, algorithms you're using, then you have one picker. So for instance, for one picker, the last right wins map is enough. For two pickers, you might need some sort of looking into what has happened and you might need some implementation of caus causality and you might need to use observed removed multimap for your implementation. So it might, actually those small change in the requirements will now mean that you need to revamp your system in a significant way. So you, you lose some agility, but you actually win customers because those customers have flaky Wi-Fi. Not because they want, but because they cannot afford to have another like better working Wi-Fi because of their constraints. So if you want to serve that kind of market, you need to tailor your solutions to that. And what I wanted to say is Scala is a very nice ecosystem for, for that kind of thing. So if, let's say, I would like to implement all that stuff in TypeScript, for example, I would need I would need to implement all the three monad stuff that you get in CATS from scratch and I would need to use something else for dissemination of my root hashes than ACA distributed data and I would probably need to write all that stuff from scratch and test it and believe me, many, many days, many months and, or maybe many years went into testing that kind of tools so you can use them uh, with confidence and you can actually uh, use them very easily. So this, that's something that we are getting with using Scala, we are getting uh, for free because there are people who have worked very hard to make those things happen and if you want to change your ecosystem then probably you are in a very uh, difficult place between rock and, uh, and uh, something very hard. Any questions? Which indexes? I mean, uh, all these references, uh, the hashes, uh, for example, parsing them uh, uh, successfully applied, parsing them successfully. It wasn't applied to them. And uh, all uh, IP, IP tests uh, on the particular device you broke. 
Yes, very good question, actually. So the pr problem, problem here to restate the question is, I'm changing something on my device. What about the updates on other devices? So what helps me is that IPFS is actually content adjustable storage. So the hashes are uh, consistent. So if I add something to IPFS on my node and I get a hash, if I resolve it, this hash on some other device, then what I will get is the same object because they just can kind of communicate underneath using this peer-to-peer -peer magic and I'm getting the same object back. So there is no way I get something broken. What might happen is that something is delayed. Right? That's one important thing, you need to causally distribute your root hashes. So let's say someone has a root hash, one root hash, and the other person has a different hash, and they think that they have an authoritative source of knowledge on the whole structure, and they apply their changes. Yes, those changes might be lost. So if someone applies a change on a hash, that's the same thing that happens on a Bitcoin. If, let's say, I propose a new block with an update, and someone proposes some other block with an update, and his block, well, their block actually, gets included in the blockchain, then my block is lost. Basically what, what we are building is blockchain. So if you want those updates to be consistent, well, Please don't laugh. Uh, IPFS is, is actually um, a part of a thing that's called fi Filecoin and is some, some sort of file storage on blockchain, whatever. It's a useful piece of code. Someone wrote it, tested it, and it's really rock solid. I'm just going to use it because my license permits it. I'm also going to use Akka because it's there. Someone wrote it, someone tested it, and someone even fixed bugs. Um, and I'm just going to use it because it's, it's, it's well tested. But yes, you need to think about how to implement it in order not to make such mistakes. Yes, you're on your own. So this kind of software development is really hard. Don't do it if you don't need it. <laughs> I mean, for 99 and then some nines percent of population, um, Postgres database with a PHP script is, is really fine enough. And you, 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 you actually um, win on agility with that. So it's like, but I'm kind of convinced that this is a, this is a good thing. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, I got a question. Yes. So, um, coming back to your bulletproof or replica. Yes. Yeah. Maybe I missed it, but isn't there like a library you could call instead? Yes. It's not very much supported. So no one actually um, put a commit in it like for the last two years. And when I'm, when I'm evaluating software for inclusion in my project, what I do? I go to the GitHub repo and I look for the date of the last commit. If the last commit has been like a year ago, then I need very strong reasons to actually use that library. Okay. When, when was the last commit for that library? IPFS Scala. Yeah. IPFS Scala, like two years ago. IPFS, probably in the last minute. So this is, this is why I would use something like, uh, I, I, I could use something like that as the first approximation. Actually, IPFS is a very hip library, so you would communicate with the daemon running on the same computer as your program, so like client-server, over HTTP. So actually, in reality, I would probably use HTTP to get all those answers and have the, you know, the help of getting either in, in, uh, as, a, as a way of representing uh, the HTTP uh, error that occurred. 
So I wouldn't use the command line in, in interface. But as a first approximation, I think it might work. That's an There's a library, and if there is someone who would be taking care of it, then I think everyone would be happy. So are you using that in production? Are you asking me if I'm using that code in production? No, are you using IPFS in production? Yes, that's not a secret. Actix is using IPFS in production. I didn't say, I didn't say, I didn't actually say that we are using that code on production or that we are using uh, IPFS in conjunction with uh, uh, certain other technologies on production. I just uh, checked there is Java IPFS API and there is Rust commit manager ready to go. Yeah, that would be interesting. We could be using that. We could be using actually, uh, exactly as I was saying, we could be using an HTTP API. And that would be really fine, with, without that, that sort of thing. And it works OK. OK, any more questions? I mean, what's the performance of that, or what? I already said we are not using that, so I cannot ah. answer your question because we didn't evaluate it, never. No. The problem is uh, if you're building a distributed system, there is a different level of uh, performance that you find uh, okay. I mean, it's not for all usages. Uh, distributed systems are kind of slow. Uh, compared, for instance, with um, SQL databases. <coughs> so if you go to um, ACA distributed data and look for like a, a level of performance, that would be like on, on the order of thousands updates per second, but not on the order of millions updates per second, if that's what you're asking. But it's really fast. IPFS is very fine-tuned. So it's, uh, in practice, it's, it's really fast. Compared to other solutions of, of the same, same kind, and this would probably not be a bottleneck, even if I use that. Any other, other questions? If not, then thank you very much for having me.